giving them to him by confronting idolatry in his own family. The enemy is prepared to attack, and the Spirit of God comes to Gideon, comes upon Gideon. He will ask for a fleece to see if God is with him. God will then instruct Gideon to make his army small enough to make sure it is clear that God is the one who brings victory. The army is reduced to 300 people. God gives Gideon further assurance by telling him to go into the enemy's camp and hear what they are saying about their fear of Gideon and his army. Sometimes those italic sections include a lot of sections, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that gets summarized in those little italics. But one of the things I want to invite you to look at in this section as you read through these things during the week is who does God choose? Does God always choose the people who already seem to be qualified to be leaders? No, he ends up choosing people who see themselves as not being qualified, but yet they become qualified as God works through them and in their lives. And it always gets my attention when I'm reading through this section the way that the angel of God speaks to Gideon. You would think that since Gideon, basically the Midianites are the bullies, they come in and every time they steal all the, the lunch money from the people of Israel all the time, or they basically are just bullying. They're taking whenever there's food, whenever there's anything, the Midianites come in and steal it. They take it because they're stronger. And so Gideon is at the place where he doesn't even want to thresh his wheat out in the open because he knows that if he threshes his wheat in the open, it's just going to be stolen. So where is he? He's hiding up in the wine press, a place where he thinks he maybe can get away with threshing of just enough wheat so that he can get some food because he's afraid. And what does the angel say to him? Does he say, hey, wimp, hiding from the enemy? No. The angel comes and says, mighty warrior, I'm here to talk to you. Is it because Gideon's already shown that he's a mighty warrior? No, it's because God sees who he's going to become. And I think as Christians, sometimes we think that God just wants to keep us stuck in the mistakes of our past or our weakness. And I think God wants to speak words that bring out who he's creating us to be, not keeping us stuck in who we have been. And what if, and if we are to be children of God, if we're to be toward each other the way that God is toward us, how should we speak to other people? Should we speak to other people continually lifting up all of the weaknesses and problems they have from the past? Or should we as children of God speak words that bring out a future for them? That speak something more, that help them to see the gifts that they have? To free them to become who God's created them to be? So that's the way that God speaks to Gideon, is he speaks him, his identity of who he's going to become into his life. The secret, though, is going to be, I will be with you. How is it that this wimp hiding from the Midianites is going to become a great leader? He is going to have God with him, and that's going to shape him. But where does he start? Does he just go out and say, okay, I've God chosen me, I'm going to go take on that whole Midianite army? It's interesting to see where he begins. Because what's the problem? Is there a primary problem of the Midianites? Or is their primary problem the fact they've forgotten about God and they're worshiping idols? Their primary problem is the idols. And who just happens to have an altar and an idol in their, out in their possession? Gideon's family. So Gideon's a little hesitant, so at nighttime he goes and he tears down his father's altar to the idols, and he tears down his father's idol. And the next morning the people are angry. Who tore down our, our altar and our idol? But it's interesting to see what Gideon's dad says. Gideon's dad says, hey, we're not going to do anything to Gideon. If Baal's a god, he can take care of Gideon. But if he's not a god, we should probably start trusting the Lord. So from that point on, Gideon has dealt with the idolatry in his own family. And now he's ready to start focusing on the other challenge, and that's going to be the Midianite army. And from that point on, the Spirit of God comes upon him and leads him uh, to become that warrior that God saw him to be in the first place. The first reading is the book of Judges, chapter 7. Just as with Jericho, God will give a battle plan that seems silly, trumpets, and torches. So the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars, holding in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried, a sword from the Lord and from Gideon. Every man stood in his place all around the camp, and all the men in the camp ran, they cried, and fled. 
When they blew the three hundred trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow and against all the army, and the army fled. After the death of Gideon, more judges will rise up and bring renewal to the land. But each time they died, the people will become as unfaithful to God as they had been before and suffer the consequences. One of the things that had caused the people of Israel to remain faithful was they saw God do things for them and through them that they knew that they couldn't do for themselves. And now the next stage is going to be set. Will Gideon's army be strong enough that he could at the end come up with some sort of feeling that it was his effort that defeated the Midianites? And God wants to make it very clear that at the end of the story, who's going to end up getting the, the credit for it? God will. So they start with an army of 30,000, which really is still not quite big enough to defeat the Midianites. But then God says, they still might think that they won because of their own strength. So let's make the odds look a little bit worse. So first he has Gideon say, you know, anybody who doesn't feel like fighting, who might be a little bit afraid, why don't you go home? And a good chunk of those 30,000 go home. And God says, okay, there's still too many. You still might somehow think that you're accomplishing this on your own. So God comes up with an interesting plan. Probably for, for lack of a better title, it, it's a drinking challenge um, that he gives them. And the drinking challenge is, is just to go out and watch how they drink water. And most of the, the soldiers that are left will drink it in a more sophisticated way, kneeling down and just drinking the water. But 300 of them will be unsophisticated enough that they'll lap the water up like dogs. And God says, you know what? I'm going to choose the 300 that are unsophisticated enough to drink that way, and they're going to be my army. And I'm going to use such powerful tactics as blowing trumpets and smashing lamps and all that kind of thing to make it clear that it's not them, it's me. But it's interesting that when their army ends up doing what they're doing, Often the way that God ends up doing things is that they don't even need to be the ones to fight the battle as the other army starts fighting against themselves, and they destroy themselves. So we see God using them in a way that will make it clear that God is the one at work. And so today and throughout this week as you read through this section, and you see God invite them to look and see how God brought them through something that they know they can't give themselves credit for. To look back at your own life and to see where do you have testimonies of times where you did not have the resources to make it through, you didn't have the emotional resources, the financial resources, the connections or anything, and to look back and just say, you know what God, you're the only reason I made it through that, and to use that as an opportunity to build up your faith. Or maybe you're at a place now where you look at your resources and the challenge seems too big, and the time is to say, okay God. I know I can't do this on my own, so how can you help me, tell me what I need to do um, to make it through this next challenge? Next meeting, we look at Judges chapter 13. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. His wife was barren, having borne no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Although you are barren, having borne no children, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now be careful not to drink wine or strong drink or to eat anything unclean, for you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor is to come on his head, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from birth. It is he who shall begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. The woman bore a son and named him Samson. The boy grew, and the Lord blessed him. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. Samson will have great victories over his Philistines, but his weakness regarding a beautiful woman will cause trouble, which will lead to his capture and being blinded. He will pray one last time to God and kill more Philistines by pulling down a building as prisoner than he, he had in all of his previous battles. So once again, God is choosing unexpected means. He seems to have this habit of choosing barren women to be the ones through whom he accomplishes his purposes. 
And so now he once again chooses a woman who, in that culture, your identity was in having children. So she probably had some issues about her own worth. And the angel speaks to her and says, uh, you're not barren. Something beautiful is going to happen through you, trust me. And I think sometimes in our lives we might look and see, I don't have a whole lot to offer. And maybe we look at our barrenness and God says, you know what? I could be doing things through you if you will just trust me and commit your, your life to me. So we have God using this barren woman once again now to bring up the next judge who will lead. And of course, Samson was chosen because of his moral strength and character, right? No, <laughs> he was strong, but his moral character was not necessarily that strong. So the question is, can God use people before you solve all of the problems in your life? Yes. And I think oftentimes we think, well, once I get this issue dealt with, once I get over the pain of this divorce, once I completely conquer this addiction, once I finally deal with this issue in my life, then I can start doing things at church and have God start to use me. But part of the story of Samson is to say, that God uses us even in the midst of our struggles, even in the midst of our weakness. And I think sometimes that divorce might be exactly the thing that will help you to connect with someone and minister to someone as they're going through the same thing. Or that addiction might put you in a place where you can minister in ways that someone without an addiction couldn't minister. So, looking that way, as you read this week, think about how you're waiting until you get over something to offer your services to God, and ask God, how can you use me even while I'm still dealing with these issues? But looking at Samson's life, should we just want to stay in weakness so that God uses us in our weakness, or would Samson's effectiveness have been enhanced if he would have not had those issues, if he would have overcome his character issues? And so the second part I want to invite you to think about this week is, where is it that because you're not dealing with issues in your life, that you're not the blessing that you should be? That there are battles that are not being won because you haven't allowed God to bring healing to certain areas of your life. So, Samson would have continued to win a lot more battles if he wouldn't have had his issues with being manipulated due to his, his women issues. So where is it that God is getting your attention? Maybe to start a dealing with that addiction in your life or finding healing for that divorce or whatever is going on in your life so that you can be more available to bless your neighbor. And Samson, it's interesting, at the, after he has ended up through his weakness getting himself in a place where he's been captured, it is interesting for me to see that his ministry doesn't end at that point. As a matter of fact, as he prays to God while he's in bondage, that God will give him the strength to actually have his greatest victory even after he has gone through his compromise. So I just want to invite you to look in your own life and maybe you think that, you know what, back at this stage in my life, God used me to do some things, but I've compromised and now God won't use me again. And maybe it's time to trust God to, do, to end up bringing the greatest victories even after your biggest mistakes. The final reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 4. The attention of judges will turn toward events going on in the town of Bethlehem. Then also during this time period, we are introduced to a Moabite, Moabite widow named Ruth, who will marry a man named Boaz. Their descendant will be David. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. They named him Obed, who became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron, Hezron of Ram, Ram of Aminabad, Aminabad of Nashon, Nashon of Salmon, Salmon of Boaz, Boaz of Obed, so just as last week we made the transition out of the wilderness now through Joshua into the promised land and we've learned about how these divided uh, tribes would deal with their individual challenges that would come up and God would raise up 
local leaders to help them out. The time is going to come when they say, we're not satisfied being a bunch of separate tribes, that we're going to be more powerful if we come together under one king. And there are going to be issues we're going to talk about by choosing a king. But ultimately, we make that transition now at the end of Judges, and we prepare for that transition into not having local leaders called judges, but the time's coming soon when we're going to have kings leading. But once again, what is it that has made the judges or the leaders to be effective? Is it their competence or their relationship with God? It's their relationship with God. And so we start to see the same things as we move into the kings next week. That the first king is a great warrior. He wins battles. His name is Saul. But does he have issues with his relationship with God? Yeah, he, by the end of his life, he's completely disconnected. He's going to see mediums to find some sort of spiritual event. But now we discover that at the end of the period of Judges, that God chooses, once again, some unexpected people to be part of the family line of David and of Jesus. We talked about Rahab the prostitute being brought into that family line. And today we look at Ruth the Moabite. And the Moabites were despised because they didn't help the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. They hated the Moabites. And who now is going to become part of the family that will end up bringing deliverance to them? A Moabite. And so we look now, next week we'll see what happens as they go from the judges into having kings. Um, so we continue now with our time of prayer.